to the Action Network Fantasy Flex podcast presented by Prize Picks. I am your host, Chris Raybon, joined as always by my dude, Sean Kerner. Sean, what's going on, man? Uh, not much. Still recovering um, from the Charger game we went to the other day and whatever drink we had that was pure <laughs> tequila. I still don't know what that was, uh, but doing good. And looks like you're wearing a Keyshawn Johnson jersey. Oh yeah, we're wearing the Keyshawn, the 1996 Keyshawn jersey, man. Nice. That was a, I think it was a one in 15 year for the Jets with a rich coat type, but uh, still remember that year. Keyshawn ended up writing the book a year later, I think, just give me the damn ball. So good memories. But uh, yeah, man, it was fun. The Charger game was fun. We got to see some Trey Lance and yeah. uh, hopefully he's not a fantasy bust, which is what we're <laughs> going to be talking about on this show. We're going to talk all about fantasy busts at each different position. So I'm going to ask you, Sean, first, how do you define a bust? It's kind of one of those things that there's no set definition, I think, but personally, how do you go about defining a fantasy bust? Yeah, I'll just make it simple. It's it's players, I think, are being drafted too early. Um, and, you know, this could be due to injury concerns. Um, players, I think, are due for regression. Um, maybe they won't be getting as much playing time or volume as the market may think. Um, or they just don't jive with my draft strategy. If, if a player is ranked in line with ADP, but he's atop a massive tier where I know I can get a similar player a round or two later, all kind of pass up on that guy or consider him a bust because, um, you know, you can get similar value later. So it bust is a very hard definition, but it's really just guys that I'm not getting much of because of the market's much higher. Yeah. That's how I kind of look at it. I think you have a risk tolerance that kind of should increase as the draft progresses. And so a lot of times busts for me are just guys that are going uh, that are too risky for how high they're going. And we'll get into a classic example of that in a second with running backs. But I do want to ask you about bust in, in relation to injuries, because I think I would say the majority of players that do bust, it usually has something to do with an injury, but it's really tough to predict or project injuries, especially when you're talking about a median projection so how do you go about uh, kind of accounting for injuries uh, at the various positions? I know you project a slightly different amount of games played for each position. Yeah, it's, it's probably the hardest thing when it comes to projections is trying to factor in, you know, injury risk or if a guy's actually injured right now, you know, if they're going to be available for week one. So I think that's part of what you said already is early in the draft, I don't want to take on that risk. So we'll talk about him, but Saquon Barkley is a perfect example. Whereas a guy towards the end of the draft, um, if he's hurt right now, like, uh, I don't know, Rashad Bateman, he wasn't a guy that you're drafting to play week one anyway. So maybe his value gets lowered a bit and he becomes a value play. So I think it, it depends on the player, where they're being drafted, what kind of injury it is. Um, so it's a really complicated part of this. But like you said, like one of the biggest predictors going into a season is if a guy's not 100%. Um, you know, he, he has a lower floor than other players around him. So I think that that is a good indicator of players that might bust. Yeah, because you have there's a difference between like an injury prone guy who just happened to be injured in the past, but is healthy. And like if a player is injured now, just be, because a, a player appears on an injury report once that automatically increases the risk or increases the odds of him reappearing on it or re-injuring it. And I think a lot of times what you see in particular is a leg injury, a soft tissue injury, something of that nature, where a player will injure a different part of the leg later. So it's not like, okay, he has a hamstring. It's, it's not always the hamstring for the whole year. It'll be like a hamstring early in the year and then like a foot or a calf or a something else. So uh, that's what you really have to be careful for. And, and guys that are questionable for week one, obviously that, that tangibly impacts their games played projection, which impacts their, their overall season statistics. So yeah, th th those are some things I look out for. And let's start it off with running backs. Uh, you mentioned Saquon Barkley. Is that the biggest uh, potential bust do you think uh, for this season? I think so. Just based on where he's being drafted. I mean, he's still a first round pick typically in that RB six to RB eight range. Um, and you know, yeah, he has top three upside. I'm not denying that. 
um, and he might be healthy enough to play week one and prove me wrong. Um, but when it comes to the first couple rounds, I'm not trying to take risks. I think it also depends on your perceived skill set. If you're a really good fancy manager and you know you're going to crush the mid to late rounds of your draft, you know you're going to have good in-season management, there's no reason to really take on that risk of Saquon Barkley deciding your season. You want to be in control of that. So that's why I pass on him. Whereas if I'm, if I'm drafting for a buddy that's out of town um, and I know he <laughs> won't even keep the team up to date, yeah, I'll take a Saquon Barkley there because he needs that kind of like built in upside, <laughs> you know, to, to win his league. So I, I think it depends on your skill set. But for me personally, I'm passing on Barkley. Um, and you've mentioned in the past, like he's not even that great win healthy. So um, there's plenty of red flags with him. Um, but, you know, when it comes to other running backs farther down um, the draft board, I, I would say Miles Gaskin. Um, sticks out as a guy that could be a bust. Um, you know, he's going late enough at RB26 that, um, you know, he might be worth the dice roll at that point. But still, he's, you know, starting under uh, head coach Brian Flores, who comes from the Bill Belichick coaching tree, which is known to have, um, you know, a fancy situation that turns into a headache. So He's already mentioned that they could have a hot hand approach with Malcolm Brown and Salvin Ahmed. So that's why I'm 10. I'm avoiding him, even though, you know, he's probably a legit RB two to start the year. It's just after week one, we really don't know how this is going to um, form. So he's a guy that I'm kind of passing on just because uh, he has a lower floor than uh, most people think. So he, he's a potential bus candidate as well. Yeah, I think it's really interesting in the running back ranks in general, because it, it, it comes down so much to where these guys are going, because if you look back since 2014 for a top 10 PPR running back, the median overall average draft position for a running back that goes on to finish top 10 is 19th overall. So that means by the, before you're even at the end of the second round, half of the, top 10 running backs. We're not even talking top five or top three, top 10 running backs uh, are, are probably going to be gone. Whereas the receivers that finish in, in the top 10, they're pretty much evenly distributed uh, with over half of them uh, being found from rounds two to round seven. So it's a much, uh, you have a lot more upside and, and guys that can kind of fall into that wide receiver one tier later down the board at wide receiver. And there's this opportunity cost with some of these running backs because they start to thin out, you know, in early first two rounds, you're getting, you know, there's like nine to eight to nine, 10 running backs being taken per round. And then they're kind of evenly distributed through these next few rounds. But if you miss on one of those guys, you're also giving up what's probably a higher floor ceiling combo uh, at the receiver position, which I think is why a lot of these guys kind of profile is bust for me, even if they're not like, there's not a huge red flag um, for, for the particular player. It's just any little risk factor with some of these running backs in those middle rounds, you're kind of shoot your, your ceiling might be RB two upside, you know, and versus the wide receiver, it's wide receiver one upside. So uh, I agree. I think Saquon, and it's not that Saquon isn't good when he's healthy. It's that the old line <laughs> screws him yeah. up. Like he's a good running back. Make no mistake about it. Right. Yeah. It's, I meant for fantasy. Right. The O-line, yeah. the Giants O-line is ranked 32nd in the league by Pro Football Focus. It's ranked 32nd by pretty much anyone who knows anything about the offensive line. If you just, it, like, you look at this uh, line, top to bottom, there's no one that gives you confidence that this is not going to be a bottom five, if not just the worst O-line in the league. Five of Barkley's last 15 games have ended – with 30 or fewer yards rushing due to a combination of the O-line and him being, you know, injury, getting injured. So it, there's a chance that even if he's on the field for you, he could still have a game like 13 for one, which is a real Saquon Barkley rushing line, eight for 10. I mean, these are real Saquon Barkley lines, and it's not because he's a bad player, but his running style, the way, you know, he likes to kind of go for the big play and uh, with a bad O line, it's just really tough, and it, it could produce some some duds. So um, he's a guy that there's just so many other guys there that it, you're you're not compounding the the risk of 
inefficiency because of an O-line with availability. We don't know if he'll play week one. You know, that that's a tangible decrease to his projection because you're not sure. You can't project him for the normal game amount of games that every other running back gets if he's healthy. So uh, a lot of reasons to, I think, avoid Saquon. Everyone has high ceilings there. Uh, no reason to to take a guy with a lower floor. DeAndre Swift is trending in that same direction uh, in the third, fourth round. I mean, he's a guy who... His median carries per game last year weren't even 10. It was in the single digits, you know? So we're kind of banking on this increase to, you know, 12, 13, 14 carries per game for Swift to really be in this next tier of running backs after Clyde edwards Elaire. And now we don't know if Swift is going to be available week one. So that's a tangible decrease to his projection. We're already kind of banking on, uh, it's a projection just to, you know, give him increased carries as it is. Jamal Williams is there. Jamar Jefferson is there. So, I mean, Sean, how many carries per game do you have Swift at right now? Um, I would say around 13. Um, yeah, that's a projection though, right? Like that's... Yeah, yeah. There, there's a wide range of outcomes. And, you know, this team's going to be really bad. So I, I don't think he's going to have many positive game scripts. And Jamal Williams is there to eat into his, not only his rushing uh, share, but his receiving share as well. So, yeah. He, it's interesting. He's like running back 13. If you look at recent ADP, mm-hmm. he's atop this massive RB2 tier, even ahead of guys like Najee Harris, which I oh, well, I don't even I, no. have projected that high, but like I have Najee over DeAndre Swift. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's getting out of control with him. Where he's a very talented back, but the situation, the injury that you talked about, like there's too many red flags to be taken atop a tier like this. Yeah, because I think the thought is, you know, with Dan Campbell there, you know, we obviously spent time on the Saints. Maybe they use Swift like Alvin Kamara and Jamal Williams is the Latavius Murray. And I agree. And I think that's in the range of outcomes. That's it. But that's a best case scenario. And in round three, again, you're, you're probably not, you're not, you're not giving yourself a great chance at RB one upside. Even if you're, you take a RB that doesn't completely bust, you're still probably going for high end RB two, low end RB one, maybe. And they're just so many surefire receivers that are much less likely to bust. I think once you start getting that third, fourth, fifth round, like that's the wide receiver sweet spot for me is that third through fifth uh, into the sixth round. Uh, and even into the seventh, depending on the draft, you know, some guys fall for it's PPR. You can still get guys like Boyd Landry weight. So uh, I just really like the value at other positions to where I'm not really uh, looking at Deandre Swift there. So he's a little risky and, and really a lot of those running backs, in that in that tier of risky I think you know is David Montgomery going to be a, a league winner in the third round the way a, a wide receiver could potentially be a league, a league winner in that round could is is JK Dobbins going to be a league winner I mean it's just such it's on the high end of their range of outcomes whereas I think it's a little more to the middle high for the receivers so I'm I'm, I'm trying to get my first two backs by the first two rounds or first three, you know, maybe into that third, if I'm in the front of the draft, but if not, I'm probably going hero RB because uh, I, I just really like those receivers in, in the middle. Uh, let's, let's talk about bounce backs, Sean, anybody who busted last year that you think is a good, has a good shot to bounce back. Because I think what happens is fantasy is a very emotional game, uh, especially when, you know, people like us, we're drafting like hundreds of teams and, and all these best ball teams that we set and forget, but you have a lot of people listening that maybe draft two, three, one, maybe even one team and a guy busted for them last year. And that's going to influence how they think about this player going forward. So is there anyone that maybe people, you know, are, got burned by last year that you think has a good shot to rebound at the running back position? Well, this is tough because a lot of the guys that uh, busted last year, you know, out of the league, like <laughs> <Levin and Bell, laughs> Todd Gurley. So I can't, or James Connor might be better with, or, like, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to be creative here. So I'm going to say AJ Dillon is going to bounce back from being practically useless as a rookie. And um, you called it, though, that Jamal Williams is going to um, basically be the number two back in this offense. So with Jamal Williams gone, I think AJ Dillon will finally be who I thought he was going to be last year. Um, And obviously I have the most respect for Aaron Jones. He's my RB six right now. Um, But still this offense should be good enough to support two fancy running backs. So I think he will play that 
um, I'm not going to say goal line back roll, but early down roll to kind of like be a change of pace back. And they want him more involved in the passing game. So we'll see how that goes. He's just a guy that uh, I love getting in the RB 35 to 40 range where he can provide you some flex value if you're in a pinch, whether you have injuries or uh, it's a heavy bye week. And he has RB2 upside in the event that Aaron Jones were to go down. So I, I, I like him a lot this year. Whereas last year, you know, he definitely busted for people that thought he'd be a good uh, late round flyer. Yeah, uh, that was one I was on one, but I gotta I gotta kind of bring myself back down to earth because one guy I was way too high on was Clyde Edwards Elair. I loved him in the first round. That did not work out. He finished outside the top twenty in points per game. He finished outside the top twenty overall. He missed three games, and I believe he 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 had one game where he just. He was active, but he didn't play because I think he had a stomach issue or something. So yeah. it was a tough year for Edwards Elair. Only four rushing touchdowns on 181 carries. I think he will bounce back this year because there's talk of getting him a little bit more involved in the pass game in, in year two. Um, you know, we know he can do that. He did it at, you know, in, in school. And we also saw Edwards Elair get like that RB1 kind of usage early in the season before they got Le'Veon Bell. So in week one, he had 25 rushing attempts and two targets. In, in week two, he had 10 attempts, but eight targets. In week three, he had 20 attempts and six targets. Week four, 16 and three. Week five, 10 and eight. Week six, the Buffalo game, he had 26 and, and four. So they, he was getting legit RB1 usage. Uh, so we know he can do it. Uh, I think he gets a little more involved in the passing game and gets some touchdown regression. Remember, this is the high pro, projects to be the highest scoring offense in the league. So uh, I think Edwards Ware will be uh, back in in that low end RB uh, one or or high end RB two spot where uh, where he's kind of getting drafted by. Uh, what do you think of Ceh this year? Yeah, I love uh, buying low on him because almost all the reasons we loved him last year are still there. So we're just getting him cheaper. Um, and who knows if, you know, the COVID deleted off season last year had anything to do with him. He did start off hot, so maybe it didn't, but I think heading in a year or two, he's the kind of guy, the kind of guy that I don't want to be sleeping on. So I'm fine taking him at ADP. Yeah. And I, I do think he's a, to be fair, I think he's a high floor guy. Like I, I don't think he's matches. Like he has like the, the Camara, Henry ceiling or anything like I think you're still taking him because he's just a very high floor guy on, on a good offense you know as we talked about with Dave Richard but um yeah I, I, I definitely think he bounces back outside that you know gets back inside the top 20 uh let's uh talk about wide receivers let's go to the wide receiver position this one there's so many so many guys here that I think it you know, you almost kind of get lulled into taking some of these guys and there's a lot of group think with ADP. So I'm interested to hear, like, who do you think it, it, among these wide receiver ranks uh, is a potential bus candidate in 2021, Sean? Yeah, it's hard to find because I, I do love the wide receiver position. I think ADP is uh, pretty sharp this year and there's, there's guys at all levels of the draft that I'm targeting. Um, but I'm, I'm finding that, you know, Adam Thielen's a guy that, I've been avoiding because, you know, his 14 touchdowns last year were career, career high. Um, he hasn't scored more than seven. Uh, only one other season he scored more than seven touchdowns. Um, so I think we're due for some touchdown regression there. And, you know, the Vikings defense should be much better, which means we'll see some more run-heavy game scripts. If you look at last season when he, he scored 14 touchdowns, he finished outside of the top 60 27% of the time. That's an insanely high rate for wide receiver two. Um, so he has a lower floor than people realize. And I don't like that when it comes to season long fantasy football. So that's why I've been avoiding him. Um, and another guy that, you know, I don't necessarily hate him, uh, but it's DJ Moore. He's sort of drafted in that mid tier, uh, wide receiver two range. Um, and he's the kind of guy where I don't hate him. It's, I think his other receivers have, um, more value ADP. So guys like Robbie Anderson, Terrence Marshall, I love them at ADP. So just by default, I'm sort of avoiding DJ Moore. I think you can get um, sucked into taking him high based on his talent. But, you know, Sam Darnold is not going to be able to support all three receivers and Christian McCaffrey and potentially Dan Arnold. So, you know, the volumes 
a concern with more and he hasn't shown that touchdown upside that we need to kind of replace the potential drop in volume. So while I like DJ Moore, I think he's being drafted just a little bit too high. Yeah. I, you know, when you look at busts uh, from years past and the ones that are not due to injury, because again, so many are, but the ones that aren't, I think a common theme is just bad quarterback play. And even if Sam Darnold improves this year compared to what he was doing with Adam Gates, you have to figure he will. You can't argue with the fact that Sam Darnold is a bottom tier starting quarterback and right. compared to what these other fantasy receivers have, right? Like there's a big difference between even like a Sam Darnold and a Kirk Cousins. So, you know, it, it's, it, I, I do worry about, and I, I, to be honest with you, I've even, it's even crossed my mind, like Robbie Anderson could bust too, as much as That's I know impossible. we both like him. It's impossible <laughs> until it happens. Right. But yeah, uh, when he busts, it'll be the first time, but yeah, I, I hear you. But I, I always say never underestimate Robbie Anderson, but I, I hear you. No, I'm, I'm not underestimating. I'm just, yeah. I'm just kind of, I think the important thing is here is like, we kind of put, you know, the range of outcomes out there for people that just like, otherwise they wouldn't have thought of it. You know, it's like, cause I think that's yep. what happens in this wide receiver uh, tier. It's very deep and it's kind of, you see all these guys there and uh, you know, they're kind of in these, these bigger tiers and you just feel comfortable taking any of them. And then you look back and you're like, Oh, in retrospect, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have had like yep. two Sam Darnold receivers in the top 30, you know? And <laughs> said, so uh, yeah, I had to, I got to put that one out there, but for me, the, the number one guy I see, and I hate to say it because I think he's a talented guy, but it might be a year too early to take him this high, and that's Jamar Chase. Uh, you know, he's, be, he's being taken, I think, a lot closer to a rookie wide receiver's ceiling than, a rookie, than, than the true outcome for like a first-round rookie receiver. I think Devontae Smith, you know, going in the mid-30s, I think that's closer to the fair expectation for year one. For, for a round one guy, even as talented as Chase. You know, Jalen Waddle is kind of going there too. Uh, but Chase is going right outside the top 20. Uh, and he's wide receiver 21 uh, in my fantasy league over the past, uh, since August 15th. Wow. And yeah, and, and I see him taking in that same range in underdog best ball drafts and things like that. And listen, the guys had, uh, by all accounts, a, a pretty rough camp, a lot of drops, um, the coaching staff's talking about, Hey, maybe we get Auden Tate, you know, a veteran, some, some, some snaps don't, don't put everything on Chase's plate, you know, early on. And so listen, does Chase have humongous upside, especially playing with his college buddy, Joe Burrow? Absolutely. But the median outcome for why a rookie first round pick at wide receiver is not wide receiver 20 wide receiver 21, you know, it's in, it's going to be in the mid thirties. And so I just think, first of all, I think T. Higgins should absolutely go ahead of Chase. I've had Higgins ahead of Chase um, in my projections the whole draft season. I think Higgins is the guy that, you know, year two breakout. Um, but I just think Chase, compared to some of the other guys you can get in that same range, I mean, sometimes Chase goes before a guy like Julio Jones. I mean, I even think Adam Thielen is still safer than Chase just because we have, we know Adam Thielen's a great route runner. We know Adam Thielen is like, you know, locked into 20, 25% of those targets in Minnesota. It, it just might be a low volume offense, but like yeah. Chase, we, we have, there's such a wide range of outcomes. He there's, there's two guys that could be target hogs and, and one guy that could be an air yard hog in T Higgins. And then Boyd is also a target hog. So I think there's just a, a little bit too much risk there at, for Chase. Uh, Michael Thomas, his ADP is all over the map, but I would be remiss to mention to not mention him. I just don't know how, where to put the game's play projection. I don't know what kind of offense he's going to be in. If he's, is it going to be lower volume with, with if it's Jameis and it's, it's not Drew Brees anymore? How's the efficiency going to be without Drew Brees? Um, you know, it, there's just so many question marks, such a wide range of outcome. I still see him getting taken as a starter, um, as a wide receiver three, sometimes four. I don't think you want to do it. I think there are just uh, higher floor, higher ceiling, uh, or, or same ceiling, higher floor picks at, at his ADP, just because you also have the missed games. I mean, what, how many games do you have them, uh, Sean? Um, to get the, the ranking I want, I have them missing like five games. So I have uh, projected like 11 and a half games played. 
So is that are you trying to bump him up or down? I'm by trying. Giving? He's he's so interesting, and I agree with your your logic, but. I think it depends on what league you're in. Um, you know, if you're starting three receivers and he's like outside of the top 40 now and he's going on your bench and let's say you're in a league where the, the rest of your league isn't very good and you know you're going to make the playoffs, then I'm comfortable taking Michael Thomas because you can afford having him on your bench. But if you're in a really competitive league um, where everyone's sharp, then yeah, I'm, I'm going to avoid taking him because you're trying to make the playoffs. So I think it really depends on format. Um, you know how I love stashing uh, guys that are injured to begin the season uh, if if they fall too far. And he hasn't gotten there quite yet. But if he falls outside, I say, top 35, I think I am willing to take that gamble if I think I'll make the playoffs regardless having him on my bench or not. Yeah, I, I'm not there. I mean, I but just you, – you're concerned even when he does return that he – Yeah, he I just don't yeah, think it's – that's fair. Because I think, listen, I, you know, I put a lot of stock into things like, you know, targets per route run. And, you know, I know we, you know, we kind of use the catch rates and different, and like those things are just so jacked by Drew Brees. And like, he was such an other, I mean, this guy was completing like 75% of his passes and Thomas was his number one target. Now I know Jameis Winston is a high upside player. He's going to increase the average depth of target, but you know, they're just like, we, we haven't seen these, these guys really haven't played together because Thomas has been out. We don't know how it's going to unfold. We don't know if Taysom could, you know, how many starts Taysom is going to make, even if Jameis starts the season as expected. Uh, so I, I just, I still think that there's guys that you could get six, six, 16 games worth of production where Michael Thomas, like you're giving up games and you really don't know if he's going to get back to that wide receiver one to status and be consistent. Right. Like, cause yeah. you know, if, if he comes in and he's like, okay, do you even start him that first game? He's back. Like may, it, it might not be a slam dunk and you know, how many snaps is going to play. And then if he's ineffective that game, then what do you, you know, it's, yeah. I just, it's, I, I just can't think like, I can't really think of a wide receiver aside from Odell Beckham. Uh, he comes to mind and that was obviously a big one, but that like really paid off to stash. Like I remember AJ Green just didn't even play. Uh, Devo Samuel last year, what did he give us? Like a few, like half season worth of, like he was decent when he was in there, but he missed like a ton of time. Yeah. Um, I'm tw- who else? Can you think of any, like the other recent ones? Off the top of my head, but yeah, you're, you're right. It, it, it depends on the situation, but um, right now he's, he's not quite there yet. But again, if he falls outside of say the top 35, that's when I would consider it. But yeah, like you said, even when he does return, it, he's not a slam dunk. Yeah. It, to me, it, it has to be like, I mean, I'm not getting any cause he's, he's still going way too high for me, but I would say he has to be outside the top 50 because I think I can get like, even with my wide receiver four, I kind of treat that like a starting position. Cause it's either going to be my flex or, you know, that first wide receiver for bye weeks So I kind of want another like pretty solid high floor guy um in, in that spot so like I, there's a lot of guys i take over yeah. um michael thomas He's probably never gonna drop to 50 so yep, nope like you're out. yeah that's name <laughs> value so yeah no i'm just but yeah, yeah that's that's a bust for me and another one who actually should play uh Cortland sutton and i've really struggled to rank him i'm actually interested in your your take on sutton sean because like Number one, I don't, I don't know his availability. I don't think we know his availability for certain. Like, is he definitely a hundred percent right now headed into week one? Um, And like, we're, we're pretty much, I think there's a consensus that Jerry Judy is going to take a big step forward in year two. Um, You have Hamler having a great camp. Noah Fant still there. You have two running backs that, you know, can catch the ball. So, I just worry that Sutton is not going to be that same receiver that he was when he was uh, like a great fantasy asset, because that was no one else was really there in Denver, you know, especially after they, they traded Manuel Sanders for that second half of the season. So like, how are you approaching that projection for Sutton? Cause I'm, I'm just worried about like the defense being better and they're just not being enough to go around to really make him that like slam dunk, like high floor wide receiver two, three. Yeah. I, I'm with you there. He's all the way down to like wide receiver 40 for me now yeah. and it looks like recent ADP uh he's still going ahead of Jerry Judy yep. so I have Jerry Judy ranked like 10 slots higher and can get him cheaper so again this is the type of offense where I'm not trying to invest in multiple 
targets. Yeah. So it's Jerry Judy for me or bust. So um, I'm passing on Sutton. And you mentioned KJ Hamler has looked great. Um, and Sutton's a guy, he could get hurt if um, not injured, but um, you know, get a downgrade if Teddy Bridgewater does take over as quarterback. I think either way, Jerry Judy has chemistry with Drew Locke and he fits Teddy Bridgewater's skill set. So I think he's pretty bust proof when it comes to the quarterback situation. Whereas Sutton, I think he really does need a gunslinger like Locke to be under center to be valuable. So I think that the threat of Teddy Bridgewater potentially taking over, I think hurts Sutton's long-term value as well. Yeah. It, it's a real tough one because I, it's like, I do, I do get it. Like I do, I do see the upside there. I, I think for me, it's just more about the floor because I, I don't want to make the mistake of, I think last year we kind of felt that way about Teddy Bridgewater with Robbie Anderson, you know, like, Oh, Teddy Bridgewater is going to be bad for Robbie Anderson and, and Robbie Anderson ended up having a great season in that same position. So it can be done, but I don't think Denver is going to have to throw the way Carolina did because Denver's defense is going to yep. be probably top five. So that that's what kind of does it for me. I just see safer picks um, at that at that range. And I think most of these wide receivers, you know, in like the 25 to 40 range have similar upside. They're all kind of, you know, they could get, you know, 20 plus percent of the targets and and, and whatnot. So I it's just it's just more about floor for me with Sutton. I think he has a little bit lower of a of a floor, and there's there's some injury uncertainty there. So uh, he's a, a potential one for me. Uh, what about bounce backs, Sean, at wide receiver? Anyone that busted last year that you see bouncing back in 2021? Yes, that would be Michael Gallup for me. Um, I think he was drafted like a wide receiver two last year. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because we viewed him as a threat to CeeDee Lamb as opposed to the other way around. Um, so now that CeeDee Lamb's going in the top 10, I mean, his ADP has gotten a bit out of control. I haven't been able to get him as much. I've loved taking Gallup in that wide receiver 45 or 50 range. Um, you know, he was hurt last year based on his route tree. He had, you know, sort of the downfield threat route tree. And when Dak got hurt, that made him almost relevant. Um, whereas this year, they're lining him up in the slot more. I think he'll sort of be that CeeDee Lamb role that we saw last year. Um, so I love Michael Gallup's upside. Um, and I think he has a pretty high floor. I think even if Cooper and Lamb were healthy all season, I think he's a wide receiver three. But if either one were to go down, he has that massive upside, you know, wide receiver two potential. Um, so I think he's a great bounce back candidate who I think he definitely busted for people last year for reasons outside of his control. Um, and another guy uh, I, I think could be a bounce back candidate, just a late round flyer would be Brian Edwards. Um, I, I fell into the hype trap a little bit with him last year. Um, but, you know, with Nelson Aguilar out of the picture, he leaves behind 13 end zone targets. I think Brian Edwards could be the guy that picks up those. Um, you know, he's six foot three, 212. He could be, you know, De Derek Carr's favorite red zone target behind Darren Waller. Um, so he's a guy. I, I think you like Henry Ruggs. I think either Raiders wide receiver, you can get basically free. One of them is going to have to. Um, step up this year so I think taking a flyer and Edwards having a bounce back season makes sense see I, I can't I, I'm not there on Edwards man like I, I like for, so what worries me about Edwards and, and I do like rugs I think rugs is a bounce back um, my reasoning being that he was a you know he has the high draft pedigree um, he has the speed he has the inside outside ability um, you know it's year two you expect a big leap and, and I get that Edwards too, but remember going into last year, you know, rugs and Edwards were kind of the sleepers heading into that year too. And rugs ended up playing 71% of the uh, routes per game. He ran around on 71% of the dropbacks per game last year. Whereas Brian Edwards was at 30%. And yeah, he was useless last year. Right. And so, but I look at that and I say, okay, at this time last year, it was a similar thing. We were like, okay, Ruggs is, you know, he's the guy we're going to rank him ahead of him. He'll probably be the, the top receiver there, but Edwards should start on the other side. He should be the number two. He's got some sleeper appeal and he played less than half the time. And now it's like you have, yeah, you lost Aguilar, but you have John Brown and John Brown a couple years ago was like a borderline wide receiver one when he was on the bills um, last year, he was obviously hurt, but I just can't confidently say Edwards has like that 
90% of routes per game, you know, true wide receiver, you know, starting wide receiver upside. Like, I think even if he starts, I think his ceiling's a little capped. I think Renfro is going to still play it like in the slot. So I, it's hard for me with Edwards. And I mean, you could kind of say maybe that's a, a, a knock against Ruggs too, but he did play 70% of the, the routes last year. I think he has a chance to go up. You know, his high was 90, whereas Edwards high was 67 last year percent. So I think Ruggs could actually get those true wide receiver one snaps, make that big leap. So um, that's the guy I'll plant my flag on in, in the Raiders. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the thing with Ruggs is he is being drafted a little bit higher, you know, guys like, Darnell mm-hmm. Mooney or Michael Hardman, you know, I, I don't mind taking a flyer on those guys. So that's why I'm getting a little bit less rugs. Whereas, you know, Edwards is going down with like you know, Trey Quan Smith, Van Jefferson type guys. So that's why he's, he's a bit, he's a lot cheaper. He's basically free. Um, so I, I consider this sort of like the, the lions wide receivers where, you know, take a flyer on one of these guys that might hit, if not drop them, they won't kill you. Yeah, it's well, it's, I guess it depends where you draft because I do a lot of uh, best ball drafts on underdog, and Edwards is actually the like 130th overall, which is probably contributing to why I'm so like out on him because yeah, that's uh, a bit high. Yeah, yeah, Ruggs is like 115. So, uh, yeah, Edwards, yeah, he would have to be like a last pick. And a lot of times, what, I, what I'll do if I have you know Derek Carr as my QB2 in a best ball is I'll actually take John Brown because I think I think he's the guy that no one's like thinking about, but. I don't think they brought him. Like, I think there's a, there's a decent chance Brown is Aguilar. Like in rug, like if rugs doesn't improve, Brown could be Aguilar and Edwards could be kind of the same, you know? So it's, I don't know. It's, I think either way we'll know by week two, how this yeah. is starting out. It's not something that's going to take all season. And so we'll know out of the gate, how they're, you know, how they're going to handle this all season. Yeah. It's a, it's a low risk move. I, I get that. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm looking at bounce backs. I mean, the big one for me is Julio Jones. Uh, you know, I mentioned rugs, but I, I think Julio Jones at wide receiver 20 is, you know, 19 or 20 is being taken uh, near his floor. I, I think when you look at Tennessee, Corey Davis finished in the top 16 in, in receiving yards per game last year. And that's Corey Davis. And that's with, you know, that was with A.J. Brown there. That was with the tight end. Uh, John o. Smith still there uh it's it's a little bit depleted and jones could step right back into like another you know 25 percent target share even with aj brown getting the same so uh and ryan Tannehill has been even more efficient than matt ryan ryan Tannehill has thrown more touchdowns than matt ryan so i think there's some upside here for jones uh he who i don't think has fallen off you know he posted a 75 percent catch rate last year uh, i think it just the missed games killed him but uh, even though Julio has been constantly banged up, he usually doesn't miss games. And he he's put up his monster production always while playing, you know, roughly around 80 percent of the snaps per game. He's never even been like a ninety five hundred percent snap guy. So uh, I feel pretty good about Julio bouncing back. You, you don't expect guys to miss that many games, uh, you know year uh twice in a row so unless it's deshaun jackson maybe but actually <laughs> yeah. i actually like him so that's actually if you're looking for a best ball bounce back like just like i get deshaun jackson so much as like my wide receiver seven or eight because again like i still don't think you could predict him for like five games like you still he's still the median outcome is what he still plays like 14 13 14 games right yeah yeah well i mean <laughs> really Maybe. he's gonna play three or four but every game he plays will be a useful one in best uh, that's why i love the call if he happens to play 14 games i mean he will smash adp in best ball so yeah i, I think we, if marquez Valdez scantling is off the board deshaun jackson is my favorite late round best ball flyer wide receiver because of everything you said i mean he will get you useful scores as long as he's healthy yeah and he's got matthew stafford and sean yeah. McVay, and and you actually got a cover those guys underneath like woods and cup and you know so it's it, it's going to be a lot of single coverage for for deshaun so yeah in best ball keep him in mind let's go to the tight end position sean who are you eyeing as uh as bust in in the tight end ranks this year it's a pretty ugly position outside the top six exactly and that sets up my bust perfectly is once the top six are off the board I mean, it's really interchangeable for the next, I don't know, six to seven tight ends. So Noah Fant, I have ranked seventh, which some sites, his ADP is seven, sometimes it's down to 11. That's kind of my point is these guys are interchangeable, but 
Um, well, no offense to talented tight end. He sits atop a massive tier. So you're just asking, um, you know, for him to basically hit his ceiling to hit ADP. And we already talked about the Broncos. You know, there aren't that many targets or yards to go around. So a guy like Fant um, could have a pretty low weekly floor. Um, so, you know, once the top six tight ends are off the board, I'm usually punting and waiting until the end of the draft to take a flyer on like an Irv Smith or some guy like that, where if they don't hit fine, I'm going to drop them and try to pick somebody up. Whereas if you use, you know, I don't know, round eight, nine draft capital on a guy like Noah Fant, you're kind of forcing yourself to keep him for five to six games because you don't want to drop him. You spent an eighth round pick. And we saw that with guys last year, right? Um, Evan Ingram and Tyler Higby were tight end six and tight end seven. Um, and it, by the end of the season, you would have dropped them if you were smart. So um, I think it's sort of that sunk cost fallacy where you're kind of like forcing yourself to hang on these guys when you kind of need that flexibility if you miss the top six um, to kind of like play the waiver wire a bit. Maybe you'll end up having a Logan Thomas or a Robert Tunyon kind of breakout year um, if you play the waiver wire. So I think a guy like Fant, well, I like him as a tight end kind of represents that typical tight end bust that we see um, taking guys at the top of this massive, massive tier. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm in total agreement. And the way I'm starting to look at the tight end position is like, you know, a throwback to standard leagues. Like we don't really play in a lot of standard leagues anymore as experts, but if you look at the tight end stats last year, Travis Kelsey led you know all tight ends and he was tied for the lead with, with Robert Tunyon with 11 touchdowns Darren Waller had nine uh Jimmy Graham had eight Johnny Smith had eight you know if, if you look at those guys it's either they're high volume guys or they're you know aside from Graham was kind of the outlier but like Tunyon's attached to a, a quarterback that's going to throw a lot of touchdowns you know week in and week out uh, you know Johnny Smith same thing Ryan Tannehill's become a touchdown machine so uh, Mark Andrews, you know, Lamar Jackson's pretty good at throwing touchdowns. Like it's so I think it makes a lot more sense to just, if you're just wait, you know, even that's why I said, I'm not even out on Gronkowski the way I was earlier. Cause his, his ADP has dropped like eight slots. He's went from like tight end, like 10 to like 18, uh, where, I mean, I still think he has one of the higher touchdown expectations, even running like half the routes, uh, a guy like, uh, Tunyon, I think, you know, still goes outside the top. 10, sometimes outside the top 12, uh, he's got that touchdown expectation. Like it just makes more sense to, to go after that at, at this position than a guy like Fant. Cause how many touchdowns do we re really expect some combination of Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locke to throw? Like what's their yeah. upside? Like 24, 25 at the ceiling. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, it, it's, it, it's not really uh, a, a good, a, a smart move. I think that's, that's a prime bus candidate. Same thing for me. Uh, for Dallas Goddard, uh, I think there's just a lot of uncertainty. Number one, when will Zach Ertz actually get traded? Like they might hold on to him through the deadline. Uh, it's the NFC East, so you never know. They may be competitive and decide they want to keep him. Uh, Goddard, even without Ertz there, uh, how much room does he really have to grow? Um, you know, he already was in like the 70% routes run per drop back last year. He's going, uh, now he's with, Jalen Hurts, who, you know, we don't know if he's really going to be like a tight end friendly quarterback. It might, it seems to me like he's those guys that kind of make things happen off schedule, more like a, it benefits the outside receivers. Quez Watkins has also been flashing in camp. You have Rager entering year two with Smith. So I, there's a, there's a scenario where Goddard could be the number one tight end with no Hurts and just, he could be just another Noah fan where it's, you're just not really yeah. getting that, that, consistency and how, how are you handling his so every day that um zach Ertz is still there i'm lowering goddard's per game reception value by like <laughs> 0.03 like every day i have an alarm set up is zach Ertz still on the eagles yep okay downgrade goddard just a little bit but at any given time that can change but how are you handling those two projections so what i'm doing is uh, i kind of project routes run as you know kind of the, the percentage of routes run per drop back that's like the basis for my usage projection right. and that drives everything else, you know, then you get the targets per route and whatever, not, but I've just, what I do is at the team level right now, I just have the Eagles still as a two tight end team. Now what would, so I have got, got my routes run for Goddard is around like 70%. That really won't change. What will happen is I'll just move the Eagles from a two tight end team getting, you know, like, uh, you know, like 1.4 tight end routes per, uh, 
you know, were 140 percent your tight end routes, you know, per week to like, you know, the normal like 100 percent and just bump up like the fourth, fifth wide receiver. Uh, that's really what would happen. So right now I just yeah. have them as a, like a tight end heavy team, like they've been. So my Goddard projection won't change that much. And that's why I'm kind of down on him because, you know, I kind of have him locked into what I think his routes are going to be. And I just don't see a ton of room for growth. If, even if Ertz leaves, cause it's not like, like Ertz catch rate last year was under 50%. I think that would rebound, but it's not like Ertz is taking like a ton of usage from Goddard, even in, you know, projected. Yeah, like I think Ertz will command more of a target share than Richard Rogers or, you know, Jack Stoll, mm-hmm. whoever they have, but yeah, I'm kind of with you. I think, um, you know, Goddard, anytime he's drafted inside the top 10 right now, I think is definitely um, dangerous because Zach Ertz is still there. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and, and another two guys I'll talk about just real quick, Travis Kelsey could actually be a bust and it has nothing to, like he could be the number one overall tight end and still be a bust if you're taking him like early to middle first round, which I've seen a lot of even sharp people doing. And the reason is because yes, you're getting that VBD, that massive, uh, you know, boost over the the rest of the position at tight end. But in that first round, you can get like a running back or wide receiver that literally outscores everyone else in fantasy at, at, you know, at the flex positions. And what happens is like if Travis Kelsey has a 2019 Kelsey season instead of a 2020 Kelsey season, it, it could really set you back if you're taking him that early, because remember in 2019, Kelsey was the number one overall tight end. He had 97 catches, uh, 1,229 yards and five touchdowns. Now, you know, he had some touchdown variants, but he was outscored by uh, over a dozen running backs and wide receivers, even though he was the overall tight end one, you never see the tight end one, outscore the top running back and wide receivers so the fact that Kelsey was even close last year was a testament to to how good he is but you can't now if you're taking him in the first round you can't pair him with uh you know like a stud like a top like a Devontae Adams the way you could or a Tyreek Hill the way you could when you were getting him at the early part of round two you know like he was in years past so I just want I just wanted to put that out there that like Kelsey could actually finish as the TE one and still be a quote unquote bust uh, by not living up to like that top, you know, top eight uh, DVD value. Yeah, I, I think that that makes sense. I, I think people that take him fifth overall, like they're not wrong. Um, but imagine, you know, you take him pick six, let's say, and Darren Waller would have fallen to you in round three or. TJ Hawkinson or Mark Andrews would have fallen to you in round six, you'd probably regret it at that point. So that's kind of what you're getting to. And I would agree is like, you can get better value later on and load up at receiver and running back um, earlier on. So uh, I'm a big draft Travis Kelsey, um, you know, pick six or seven kind of guy, but still I can get behind that, that logic that, um, you know, he could technically be a bust, even though he finishes as the overall tight end one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I put, I put a lot of research into this cause I was, it's like so fascinating. So like, I think a lot of people love him, especially in best ball. Cause he had the top best ball win rate last year. Cause again, he had a monster season, but the year before he had one of the, he had a, a low win rate. Like he was actually negative EV and he was drafted later. I think he was, his ADP was like 17. And that's just because even at that tight end one overall season, it just wasn't up to snuff to where it, it kind of, um, was, was, we're like, um, I'm trying to remember was like George Kittle and Zach Ertz. Did they hit at ADP as well? I feel like tight end might've been a bit stronger that year. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. I, uh, I can look it up right now. So in 2019, you had Kelsey number one, you had Andrews and it was that big Andrews year. Oh. And then yeah, Kittle, Kittle was two Waller, Andrews, Ertz. Yeah. They all, they all were in, within about a point and a half of Kelsey in per game in yeah, half think, PPR. Yeah. We just had a lot of tight ends hit that year so that that definitely hurt Kelsey so if, if you do like guys later in the draft yeah I would I'd prefer them over Kelsey yeah yeah so I just and again I think if you can make it work if you're getting him like you know pick 10 11 12 I think because then you can yeah. still the, the players that you would have drafted around two it's not going to matter as much but I just mean like I, I see him going like fourth fifth you're like I, that's that to me you're, that's risky you're taking him at his ceiling which right you're only asking for trouble <laughs> yeah and speaking of taking at a guy at his ceiling i think the same is true of kyle pitts 
being at the top of that tier of the next three uh, at TE4. Um, you know, his median projection is usually somewhere between seven and 800 yards, which is going to, that would be one of the best rookie tight end seasons of all time. And, uh, and so you're taking him over wide receivers with medium projections closer to a thousand yards. And, and I get it. It's this position scarcity, but you're taking him at the top of the tier. So the position scarcity, you're not really playing to it because you can get Andrews and Hawkinson usually uh, sometimes even outside the top 60 picks. So, you know, early round six, mid round six. So uh, I think Kyle Pitts is another guy who relative to ADP, even though he's a great player um, year one, maybe it's kind of like Jamar chase. It's like, we're already taking him at, at his ceiling and there's no real wiggle room now for like all that tantalizing upside is like, it's like, you're kind of taking him there. So um, he's another guy I think is going a little too high that, uh, that I'm not getting much of. All right, let's talk bounce backs at tight end. Sean, anyone who busted last year, and there are quite a few. I mean, Ertz, Evan Ingram comes to mind. Uh, anybody that busted last year that you see bouncing back? Yeah, I think the most obvious one is Tyler Higby. Um, and I mentioned him last year, you know, you would have spent, um, you know, round seven, eight capital on him. And, you know, he, he became droppable because Gerald Everett um, was eating into his um, routes run and you know Jared Goff really um, took a step back last year so now with Matthew Stafford taking over um, I think that's going to be an upgrade and then no more Gerald Everett and yeah rookie um, Jacob Harris uh, could fill in that role but I, I think you already mentioned with Kyle Pitts it's it's really uncommon for rookie tight ends to really hit the ground running so I think that's a good thing that he's going to have uh, you know a potential stud rookie starting behind him so I think we could see him bounce back in a big way this year probably not 2019 end of season Tyler Higby good but still I think he has um, enough potential if you get him you know around tight end 10 tight end 12 um, I think he he has flashed that top six ceiling so I think he's he's a no-brainer bounce back candidate for tight end this year yeah absolutely it, he projects as my TE9 and I, you know, he finished 18th in, in overall scoring in half PPR, 24th in points per game. So uh, he's definitely a bounce back candidate, uh, but it's even still a guy I'm not reaching for. Like he still has to yeah. fall to me, like outside the top 10, um, you know, for me to really bite. I, I think if you're like missing out on the top six, what you really do is you just wait and, if you don't get like a guy like Tanya in the fall or, or, you know, Higby or Irv Smith, I think even guys like Evan Ingram could bounce back because you look at Ingram, he was fourth among tight ends and targets. We had one touchdown over a hundred targets and just one touchdown. So he's due for some touchdown regression. Um, you know, I, he's, he's the route runner. Like he's not a blocker. So Kyle Rudolph's signing, even though Rudolph's been hurt, but even if Rudolph's healthy, it shouldn't affect Ingram too much. Ingram, his lowest routes run per drop back in a game last year was 77%, which is near the top of like, if a tight end's running 77% routes run per week, that's great. So the fact that that was as low just kind of shows you, I think the, the Saquon hopefully being back and Gaudet, they'll open up some things for, for Ingram. So the touchdowns could rebound in a major way you're still, you got a guy that was top five in targets. I think he's a very interesting bounce back candidate uh, at tight end and even Ertz. I think Ertz, he's another guy who will run a high percentage of routes because he's not going to block too much at this stage. And if he gets traded, he's probably getting traded to a place where he's going to start anyway. So uh, I think Ertz is pretty low risk, you know, usually going outside the top 20 tight end. So Ingram usually goes around T 15, 16. Ertz usually goes around 20th you can get those guys there. If you missed out on everybody, you know, it, if guys like Fant and, and Goddard are inconsistent, it's going to be guys like Ingram and, and Ertz that are going to climb up the board a little bit. So uh, I like those two guys to, uh, to bounce back in addition to Higby. All right, let's, uh, let's get into a new segment here on the Fantasy Flex that we call Elite Entries, where Sean and I dive into the Prize Picks app and compare our player projections to the props to build some entries. And for listeners unfamiliar with prize picks, it's a super simple way to play DFS. Uh, prize picks offers a bunch of fantasy 
uh, and prop over under markets for both daily and season long. You got your standard stuff like Zeke Elliott rushing yards over under for the season or Josh Allen's week one fantasy points over under. You can choose the bets that you like and you build your entry. You can go with two, three, four, or even five bets in your payout it is parlay based. So it's based on how big uh, your, your entry is, how many bets you chose to put in your lineup and on, of course, how much money you risk. So for example, if you choose two props, you go under on Zeke, for example, and over on Josh Allen fantasy points and you enter $25. If they both hit, you'd win three times your entry fee. That's $75 just like that. And if you built your entry with four props, you can win as much as 10 times your entry fee. So like I said, really simple, just exponentially increases with the amount uh, of bets you choose to add to your entry. And Sean and I are going to use our projections and identify the markets we like all season long. Uh, you can build prize pick entries. All of us have a little fun and make some money. So today, Sean, what are we going to look at with our first prize picks prop? So the first prop I love is uh, Cooper Cup over five and a half touchdowns. Um, I'm projecting him closer to 6.7. I think, you know, Matthew Stafford taking over for Jared Goff really elevates Cup's touchdown projection. Um, the Rams had the third fewest pass attempts in the red zone last year. So, you know, Sean McVay trusts Matthew Stafford way more. He's going to throw way more in the red zone. Cooper Cup's going to benefit. So I love the over here. Yeah, I got cup at 6.4. So we're, we're in that same range, right around six and a half touchdowns. It's about a touchdown over the prize pick uh, number. For me, my first prop is going to be Brashad Perriman under 745 and a half receiving yards for the season. First of all, Brashad Perriman has never gained more than 645 receiving yards in five NFL seasons. His role on the Lions is not solidified. Word is he's been playing behind Khalif Raymond in camp. And on top of that, Jared Goff is a quarterback that is going to have a low average depth of target and not really look at the outside receivers running the deep routes, uh, which is Perriman's forte. So I love the under 745 and a half on Perriman's receiving yards. I have him going under that by a few hundred. I think that usage is way inflated. So uh, going under 745 and a half for Perriman. Sean, let's get another prize picks prop. So the other prop I love is Jalen Hurts over 655 and a half rushing yards. I'm projecting him closer to 750. You know, there there is some uncertainty if he'll take a second year leap as a passer, but we already know he's an elite rushing QB. Um, and rushing stats are more predictive. So the, the way I would phrase this prop is basically, will Jalen Hurts play more than 13 and a half games? And I would say the answer is yes. Um, so I love the over here, uh, uh, 655 and a half rushing yards. Yeah, I have him at 776. So I'm right with you. Nice. We're, we're both in that mid 750s range. I think you got about 100 yards of value there. And I'll, I'll meet your second over with a second under. I'm going Denzel Mims under 550 and a half receiving yards uh, on prize picks. Mims averaged about 40 yards per game in his rookie season on a 56% uh, routes run per drop back rate. But that rate could go down a lot this year because Corey Davis, Jamison Crowder, and the rookie Elijah Moore, and Keelan Cole, the veteran signing, have all been running ahead of Denzel Mims entering year two. Remember, Mims was drafted by the previous regime, and he was as low as third string earlier in camp. He had some, some, some weight issues and whatnot. But even if he gets back to, to, to hit form, he may still be no higher than fifth on the depth chart. So this is another one. I, I don't see how you can project him to, to go for another you know, 35, 40 yards a game this year based on the depth chart. So uh, I'm under 550 and a half receiving yards for Denzel Mims. All right. So that's our prize picks elite entry for today. To recap, Sean going Cooper Cup over five and a half touchdowns and Jalen Hurts over 655 and a half rushing yards. And I'm going 
Brashad Perriman under 745 and a half receiving yards and Denzel Mims under 550 and a half receiving yards. As a reminder, prize picks markets move. So you want to be nimble to lock in the best numbers. If you haven't created a prize picks account yet, check out the link in our episode description and they will match your first deposit up to $100 or visit prizepicks.com and use the promo code ACTION10, A-C-T-I-O-N-1-0 at prizepicks.com. All right, next up on the Fantasy Flex presented by Prize Picks, let's get to the quarterback bus to close it out. Sean, who do you think could potentially bust at the quarterback position this year? I'm going to have to go with Aaron Rodgers, and I hate to say it because he's my QB8. He's being drafted QB8, but he just doesn't fit in my draft plan of, you know, once these six quarterbacks are off the board, you get this mini tier of Justin Herbert and Aaron Rodgers where I haven't ranked where they are, but I think you're spending a little bit too much. I think both quarterbacks could be due for some regression. Um, Aaron Rodgers, I mean, he went ballistic last season with 48 passing touchdowns. Who knows if that was just being pissed off that Jordan Love was taken first round. Uh, But he hadn't thrown for over 30 touchdowns since 2016. Um, So I'm expecting a little bit of regression there. Um, And he's a guy where, you know, when he had, I think it was five years in a row of being the QB1, he had some rushing upside. Um, That's long gone now. He doesn't provide that anymore. And, you know, we have real running quarterbacks now. So I think it makes the QB two tier just, you know, way more valuable than it used to be. So if I miss out on the top six quarterbacks, I'm going to punt quarterback and begin the season streaming, maybe take a chance on like a Trey Lance or Justin Fields. But, um, you know, I think Aaron Rodgers, I think people regret spending high draft cap on that when, you know, running back and wide receiver especially start to fall off. So I like getting an extra running back receiver in this range. Um, so that's why Aaron Rodgers is a bust for me. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it, it really kind of depends, I think, on where you get these guys, because it's another situation where I went back and looked at where the top five quarterbacks in, in, in fantasy since 2014 have been drafted. And the median pick for to find the top five quarterback was 85th overall. And so any like any quarterback that's going high in the draft is, is a guy that could potentially bust just based on the fact that there's likely going to be a a few guys that you could find later on that are giving you a similar, you know, uh, similar upside. And I think there is truly a, a teardrop. Like there's Mahomes, Allen, Murray, Jackson, Wilson, Prescott, and then there's everyone else just because those guys give you that rushing upside. Mahomes is obviously Mahomes, but you look at like last year, for example, Mahomes and Lamar Jackson were the two guys you had to pay a premium for. And then you could get Watson and Murray and, and, and Prescott and Wilson all after, you know, round six and, you know, or in, in round six or later. And those are the guys. So I think it's, it's more about paying the premium. So I actually don't hate Aaron Rodgers to be completely honest, just because I still get him like in that, 80 pick 80th overall plus range where I'm not really paying that like season before premium for a guy that threw 48 touchdowns. Um, like I, I get it. I get it. I think he could obviously regress, but I, I personally don't hate him. The guy I'm actually staying away from a little more is Justin Herbert. And the reason because is you have those top six and then Herbert is kind of in, is that seven consensus. I think if we look back at the end of the season we might say, oh, my goodness, did I really take Justin Herbert over Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, and Jalen Hurts? Because Hurts has that Lamar, Kyler upside because of the Russian. Uh, Rodgers, he still did throw 48 touchdowns last year and has done it in right. the past. <laughs> and then and then yeah. Tom Brady, we, we, we can't stop, like, waxing poetic about how he has all these weapons, all this continuity, even has a better receiving back than last year. I mean, he could, as you've said, uh, you've made a really good point that he could have that like year two Peyton Manning Broncos type of mm-hmm. just explosion. And Herbert, there's just a lot of reasons for regressing, even if he is still a very good quarterback, which I think he is. I was on him for rookie of the year last year, but 70.4 plays per game. That's how many plays the Chargers average in his starts. 
that the league average is 64. So he played some overtime. They were, you know, it was just a, a high tempo at times. Now we have a new offense. We have, uh, you know, potentially just, it's, it's just a whole new situation where, you know, better offensive line, maybe they run it a little more with, we don't know, but the last year's numbers, not just the, the plays per game, the t- 31 touchdowns. A lot of those are on deep balls. That tends to regress. He was excellent under pressure, which is great, except pressure numbers don't tend to carry over year to year, um, potentially because all pressure situations are so different. So like just because a guy is really good under pressure, you know, one year doesn't necessarily mean he'll have the same level of success. And so Herbert was a lot like more average when it came to a clean pocket. So I just personally think Herbert has a much better chance of kind of falling into that Tannehill, Burrow, Stafford, Ryan, Cousins tier than he does of competing with that top six and, you know, Hurts, Rodgers, and Brady. Like, I think it's I think it's a lot volume-based based on last year, but plays per game, I mean, that tends to regress. Like, like if, if a guy, like the Chargers, do you have them anywhere close to 70 plays per game this year? No, not, not that high. No, it's definitely in regress. Yeah, so, like, that's kind of what I'm banking on with Herbert is just yeah. – you know, a lot. I think he's a, a very good quarterback, but he, he doesn't have that same level of rushing and, and to compete with th- those top six guys. And I don't know if he has that passing efficiency uh, to, to compete with Rodgers and, and Brady, or yeah, at least, he, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, he, he has sneaky rushing upside, but I, I, I think I agree with you where his floor is much, much lower than people are willing to let on. Whereas I, I think Aaron Rodgers will finish as a top 10 quarterback. Mm-hmm. But when I mention streamers, you know, if you follow my streaming article every year, I can typically stream the QB six to QB 10 every year, just playing matchups. What other position can you do that? You, you really can't like wide receiver. If you were to stream guys like Rondale Moore or Traquan Smith, yeah. guys like that, like you're not going to get like a elite wide receiver one. So I, I'm just saying at quarterback, it's so easy to match this level of pr- production just by using the waiver wire. And one quarterback leaves, of course. So that's that's kind of why um, I'm avoiding this here. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Her- Herbert definitely has a low floor um, for being drafted as the QB seven. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're and we're just nitpicking here in the quarterback yeah. ranks because <laughs> yeah. you know we you know we could always wait. But I just you know if you're drafting in that range of you know outside the top six, you're already giving up a decent amount. I just don't see why you would go Herbert seven over. Brady Rogers and yeah. uh you know and, and Jalen Hurts so Jalen Hurts yep yeah so that that's kind of where I am I get Jalen Hurts so much like if he gets injured it's gonna be like half of my best ball teams are just <laughs> are just sunk so uh <laughs> hopefully Jalen uh, can stay healthy and, and no more uh stomach stomach illnesses or whatever not but uh let's close it up with some potential bounce backs at the quarterback position anyone who busted last year Sean that you feel good about a bounce back in 2021 so I, I don't even consider this guy a bust last year, but the perception of him sure seems to be that way. And it's big Ben. And this is for two QB super flex leagues. I would never draft him in a one quarterback league, but you know, he's coming off a season where people are considering him washed and he threw for 33 touchdowns last year and his team led the league in drops. So I think we're going to see an improvement um, in terms of drops from his past catchers. Plus he looked really, really sharp. Um, this weekend in preseason. And I'm really thinking that last year, you know, maybe they didn't throw it downfield as much because his, his elbow surgery wasn't, you know, it wasn't a hundred percent last year. And this year he does look like he's a hundred percent. So I think he, he has some sneaky low end QB one upside. Certainly he doesn't have the ceiling of uh, Jalen hurts, but for a two QB league, I think he provides a high floor you're looking for and a massive ceiling. Cause this is one of the best wide receiver trios in the league. Even rookie um, Pat Fearmuth at tight end could be a nice weapon this year. So there's a lot of reasons to like Big Ben. This could be his final season, um, and I think he goes out with a bang. Yeah, I like that call. I've been really warming up to Big Ben, especially considering where you can get him in, in most leagues that you're going to be drafting two QBs, which are best balls or two QB leagues. Uh, he goes at that back end of that tier, and uh, I think there is some value there because – He's going to be throwing it like he's not going to run. He's not going to scramble. He's not going to get sacked. He's got a ton of good receivers. So uh, I like that call a lot. Uh, My bounce back candidates, I got two. One is Joe Burrow, who even when he was healthy, was the QB 18 in points per game. He was the 25th quarterback overall because, of course, he he missed 
a uh, handful of games to close out the year. But I think he bounces back. And I think he's the guy that can give you the same production that you're drafting Justin Herbert seventh for. Uh, you know, Burrow averaged 40.4 pass attempts per game. I think that was inflated by an overtime game or two as well. But uh, Cincinnati has been pretty pass heavy under Zach Taylor. So, you know, unlike uh, Herbert, Burrow's kind of going to be in the, you know, still same offense entering year two. Uh, I think this is a guy who you could get a couple rounds later that uh, that's where the value is for him. I, I think Herbert is the guy that's going a little too early. And then Daniel Jones, two QB league, best ball guy uh finished as the 32nd quarterback in per game points i don't know if you want to stream him to start the year because i believe the giants face was it denver and washington i think it is uh i know it's two tough defenses yeah. i think it's denver washington uh, but i think on the season i think he'll have some value he can run he's one of the, f- the few quarterbacks um you know outside that top six that can give you legit uh rushing upside on a weekly basis and you know if you think saquon is going to be you know, up to snuff and, and you also got Gallaudet. So you got a pretty good group of uh, targets for, for Daniel Jones. We have seen him throw the 300 plus yard games. We have seen him do the four plus touchdowns, you know, a, three times, I believe it was in his rookie year. So he has that upside, you know, he has the upside throwing and running uh, the defense for the Giants should be mediocre, but uh, I think Jones has some kind of long shot bounce back potential where he could he could potentially finish, you know, low end QB one uh, if all things go right, just because that rushing upside is so valuable. So Burrow and Jones for me, bounce backs. Uh, and that, uh, yeah, that, that'll get us through all the positions. We're not going to do a, a potential bust at kicker. Hopefully your league doesn't even draft all kickers anymore. You're right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the Titans kicker. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and defense. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, that's another one where it's it's just all about the streaming. So yeah. let's recap, Sean. Who is your top bus candidate for 2021 at each fantasy position? So at quarterback, uh, unfortunately, I'm saying Aaron Rodgers is a bust, even though I am in line with him at ADP as the QB eight. Um, I just think at that point in the draft, you're better off punting the position. It's you're capable of streaming a top ten quarterback anyway. So why? waste draft capital when you can just stream it um miles gaskin at running back just be careful don't draft him inside the top 25 yes he's their week one starter and i do think he has rb2 upside but with brian Flores as a head coach this is a bill belichick style coach team where you know it could be a headache we could see a hot hand approach with malcolm brown salvin Ahmed there so just be careful um and then adam Thielen at wide receiver um he's the kind of guy where if he falls to me at the end of the wide receiver two tier, that's fine. But I think he's due for some massive touchdown regression this year after scoring 14 touchdowns last year. Um, and then he has a very low weekly floor. He finished outside of the top 60, 27% of the time last year. That's very low for wide receiver two. Not the type of wide receiver I like having in fantasy. And then at tight end, Noah Fant. Similar to Aaron Rodgers, I have him ranked in line with ADP at tight end seven. But once the top six tight ends are off the board, you're better off waiting and drafting an Irv Smith much later on. He has just as much much upside, but you get him super cheap. So that's how I'm handling the tight end position this year. My top fantasy bust at quarterback for 2021 is Justin Herbert. I expect some play per game regression for the Chargers. 70 plays per game in his starts last year. I don't think he has as good of a floor ceiling combination as Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, or Jalen Hurts, who go after him in most drafts. At running back, it's Saquon Barkley. I simply don't think you should be taking that kind of risk early in round one uh, or round two. Saquon had five of his last 15 games end with 30 or fewer rushing yards, and the O-line is ranked dead last in the league heading into the year by pro football focus. So uh, he could have efficiency concerns in addition to the availability concerns as he rehabs from the torn ACL at wide receiver. My top bus candidate is Michael Thomas. I think there's too much uncertainty as far as how many games he's going to miss as far as how he's going to look without Drew Brees at quarterback, uh, how, how high volume is the saints offense going to be? Is he going to get traded? There's just so many question marks that I think there are guys that you could get a full season's worth of production 
from rather than betting on Michael Thomas and getting, you know, two thirds of it, maybe. And at tight end, Dallas Goddard is my top bus candidate, very similar to Noah Fant in that he's just going uh, on the high end of the next tier of tight ends after the top six. And I don't think any tight end really is deserving uh, of being taken that high. Goddard, I don't see his production improving all that much. Even if Zach Ertz gets traded, I think the Eagles just become more of a, a one tight end team. And, and a lot of those extra routes go to wide receivers. I think Goddard is kind of topped out in that aspect uh, already. So Justin Herbert, Saquon Barkley, Michael Thomas, and Dallas Goddard are my top busts for 2021. Hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. You can find Sean on Twitter at the underscore odds maker. You can find me on Twitter at Chris Raybon. Be sure to check out actionnetwork.com for our fantasy football content roundtables. Uh, and of course, our fantasy tool where you can use Sean and my projections, enter your custom week settings and, and get your custom cheat sheets and all that good stuff. And thanks as always for listening to us every season. We love you guys. And now that we've got this new feed, we really need your help. Follow, rate, review the new Fantasy Flex feed. It's the single biggest way to help us out. We'll grab one Apple podcast review every week leading up to week one. And Sean and I will pick a winner and send you guys some swag. So don't forget to do that. We'll be bringing you five episodes per week once the regular season gets underway. Until next time, let's get this money. <laughs>